Now this is the formulas I copied from the last time. We have been discussing the photoelectric effect. That is the ejection of an electron from an atom by an external electromagnetic radiation <coughs> with frequency omega. And this is the so-called differential cross-section. We have previously defined the meaning of the cross-section here as the electron is moving in a certain direction in this inside the solid angle centered at the origin. So it is customary to write the expression in this fashion. And here this was the matrix element which, is, which essentially carries all the dynamics in the system. Rho is the density of final states which we have computed to be as such last time based on the box renormalization prescription. I don't want to go through that because we have discussed it in detail. The box renormalization is a, a very interesting process. It's based on the fact that we fill in the space with some virtual cells and we impose the condition that wave function vanishes on the walls. And we have also discussed the uh, possibility of detecting it as a physical entity or not. And we have discovered that because of the very form of the wave function of the plane wave, this is not detectable. Therefore, it's a mathematical structure. And we can freely play with this without any worry to how to detect it or not. And we choose an arbitrary box size L. And then at the end of the day, we let that L goes to infinity without spoiling anything. And because we guaranteed by the very structure of it that it's not going to enter into any physical expression or it's not going to spoil anything. And uh, perhaps it's better that I write here the form of the wave function, which is the coordinate and the position eigenvector basis for a plane wave carrying the, corresponding to a free particle carrying the momentum P. And in this new recipe, it is I over H bar P dot X. So this is the renormalization I was talking about. L is the size of that mathematical box. I underline that it's a mathematical box, not a physical box. There is no such thing as compared to the actual box, which is different than this. So this is the uh, density of final states. So what we have to do next is put, to put them together and then turn our attention to the determination of that matrix element. Let me remind you what that matrix element was. F, the amplitude F from initial to final. Initial one is an electronic state, quantum electronic state in the atom. F is the free particle final state. I omega over C n dot x epsilon dot P I. This is the matrix element that we are going to deal with. OK. So perhaps, uh, as a first step, let me substitute that expression and then turn our attention to the computation of this matrix element. So the pi alpha times h bar over m squared <coughs> omega times the rho. Rho is L cube. Notice that L appears in here, which might be a source of worry for some of you at this level. You'll see it's going to nicely cancel if we use the same prescription in the computation of this, which we have done with the final wave function. So 2m kf. PF and KF are related. One is the momentum, the other is the wave vector, as you know quite well. 
Okay, times f i squared. Okay, so this is our intermediate expression. Some cancellations may be carried out. For instance, that m, that 2 cancels with that 2, etc. Well, okay, pi alpha h bar, sorry, it's not the 2, it's the m that we are canceling, of course. So let's put the 2 pi in here and h kf as such m omega and it's better that we put this phase space factor in here as well l cube divided by 2 pi h bar cube and okay fine this is going to lead us to the final expression and when we are finished with the matrix element, let's do that. It is a, a rather tough matter, but if we do it straightforwardly, you'll see that it's no big deal, really. So it is this expression that we are going to compute. Before, to get started, let's emphasize, underline that these are the operator, momentum and position operators, this is the initial state, and that's the final state. Initial state is a quantum electronic state. The final one is the free particle state of the outgoing electron. If it move, after moving a few centimeters away from the atom, it becomes a free particle. So that's the reason why we have represented by the free particle solution, that wave function. Okay, so I write this expression as Inserting here completeness relations, that's identities, that is, this one here is going to be d cube x, x and x, and I have to insert here another completeness relation. Of course, I have to use another dummy index. These are intermediate relations. These are position eigenvectors, therefore they are complete, and this is the completeness relation. Once we insert them, then this expression, the amplitude becomes a double integral, d cube x, d cube x prime, f x, x e to the r omega over c n dot x operator, epsilon dot p operator, x prime, x prime i. So that's what I get. Well, the reason why we, we have inserted these completeness <coughs> relations is that we know how the, the x operator and p operator acts on those. Let me remind you, it's so important I don't want you to miss the essential point. That's the definition of this eigen uh, value equation for the position operator. We use the same notation x, therefore, to distinguish the eigenvector, eigenvalues and vectors. With the operator, I put the additional superindex OP for the position. Okay. And so that's how the position operator acts on its eigenvectors. And you may be wondering what is the effect of P operator on these position eigenvectors. <coughs> You would have normally thought it is h bar over i times the gradient, but that relationship is only valid or true, true, only true for the wave functions which are the coordinates, but for the position, for the eigenvector is i h bar. Please, probably, I have mentioned this before last, I don't know. If not, please take it as a private homework and verify that it is with this sign, not the with the minus. So it's not h bar over i, as compare against p operator on psi of x is h bar over i del psi of x. Okay, so it's not the same. Well, it's only natural because when you write an arbitrary state in the Hilbert, arbitrary state vector in the Hilbert space, in terms of the coordinates, how you do that, Here's an arbitrary Hilbert space vector. There is a summation, 
as it is continuous spectrum summation is the integral and the coordinates basis vectors which are the EIs sum over I's and the coordinate which is the VI. Never forget this analogy when you have any difficulty in understanding, appreciating our, uh, uh, our formalism in the Hilbert space. That is the one-to-one -one correspondence. Sum continues. Basis vectors and eigenvector complete and orthonormal. That's the point of a basis, right? And then the coordinates. That's the coordinate. And why it is a coordinate? If you write it in explicit form, obviously it is a coordinate because that's the projection of that vector along that basis, which is the case for this as well. V dotted into, no, sorry, this not this one, this E I, right? And that's the definition of a coordinate. You take the vector and take the projection along given position eigenvector. So once we understood that basics of the formalism, let's patiently try to compute that expression. It looks quite cumbersome at this level, I know, but we, you'll see that how uh, it simplifies rather fast. First of all, let us specify the wave functions. This wave function we take to be the innermost. If it is a hydrogen-like uh, atom, we take the uh, usually the case that it is the innermost electron which is ejected out in the photoelectric effect. So innermost one is the ground state, purely a S wave, and it's only radial. So for a hydrogen-like thing, we put the Z is the atomic number. So Z cubed pi A0 cube 1 half e to the minus Z R prime over A0. If it is the hydrogen Z equals 1, you just set the Z is equal to 1. You recognize that it's to be the ground state wave function, which is spherical symmetric. Obviously, the R prime is because that is the state, that's the coordinate, and that's the wave function that is. So this is the wave function. And there's another wave function which we have to specify in here. What is that wave function? That wave function is this one. But the conjugate of it isn't it. Because this one here as it stands is x f, or perhaps we can denote it as in pf. Writing p doesn't make it a coordinate basis. It is just that the final, the final state of the electron which is moving out with the momentum p, it's in a Hilbert space vector. So it is this one here. So I have to change take the conjugate. So it is L minus 3 halves. It is a to the minus i over h for p dot x. If you had some time, free time, on your own, say, half an hour or so, I would have invited you to work out with the possible sign mistake that you may carry out at that point and see how it results, how it affects the physical results. The physics, is in, the physics is interesting. You should really play with those things. Suppose that you made a mistake in here. You overlook the fact that it was, it's not the wave function, it's the conjugate. How does the fi it appear in the final state as something wrong? <coughs> I don't know. As I said, it's just a cross-cross puzzle-like enjoyment for your free time, if you have any. Probably not. So let's uh, go on. So let's take the constants out. What do I have if I take the constants out? There's a z cube there. There's a pi a zero cube already. And there's also similarly an L cube down in here. And the power is pi cube, one half. At this level, you may be distressed a little bit, saying that it is a length cube and length cube, length to the sixth and square root, one over the length cube. And eventually I will get the square is the length, one over the length to the sixth power. Is there something wrong with the, the dimensional counting? But you, if you just to warn you that you have to be very careful with the mathematics because it's the physics which enables you to check. So it, is, it looks as if a little bit too much, one over to the L to the six. Well, it, it's correct, obviously. We have been doing everything correctly till now. And then <laughs> d cube x 
e cube x prime and that wave function minus e to the minus i over h bar p dot x I am suppressing the label PF. We know that P is the momentum of the final electron. So if there is a, any worry that we are going to get confused with the notation, we can put the F in, but let's not complicate the notation any further. And also let's put that wave function here too. That's the X prime, therefore it's R prime, the length associated with the second of the dummy integrals. And there's the now the matrix element. Let me finish uh, one step at the upper uh, level before copying it down. Notice that the X operator is a Hermitian operator that acts and to the right and left equally. So if this acts to here, it may act to the right as well. What does it become? It becomes X. Because X operator and on the X gives you the number X. Operator to number. Okay, so I will copy it as the x without the op, and this one is acting on here, is giving you i h bar times the gradient with respect to x prime. Okay, let me copy it as such. So, x e to the i omega over c n dot x i h bar del x prime. Oh, sorry, I forgot the epsilon dotted into epsilon dotted into del x prime acting on x prime. So these are all, this is a differentiation operator with respect to the number x prime, numbers vector, right? And that's the x, but c numbers, there are op, no operator. This is an operator, but its, op, its meaning is clear, dy dx prime. The next step is to pull this group of things, complicated expressions, out of the matrix elements. Can we do that freely? We can. Because if we pull it to the left, this is a function, it already comes out, there's no problem, numbers come out. Funct num functions of numbers come out easily. This is a derivative acting only on the x prime, so I, if I pull this out, I can do that safely. It never jumps over anything involving x prime, so there is no danger. So let me, instead of rewriting everything, let me rewrite this only, and then we will re rewrite everything. So it is i h bar e to the i omega over c n dot x epsilon dotted into del x prime. That's the gradient with respect to x prime. We have to emphasize that. x and x prime. Right? When I pull this out, it is only that matrix element, which is the orthonormalization condition, and which is nothing but the delta cube of x minus x prime. Delta is symmetrical, right? Whether it's x prime minus or x or x minus x prime, doesn't matter. Delta of minus x is the same as delta x. It's good. So what we are going to next is using this delta, we are going to carry out one of the integrations. And we are going to use the definition of the delta. Let me remind you dx f is, is a smooth function. Delta x minus a is f of a, right? That's well provided that the a is contained in the range of integration. That's important. If it's at the side of the integration limits, you have to be careful in defining half of it or everything. But once the e zero is contained in the integration range, that's a safe relationship. And in how do I carry out the integration involving the derivatives f of x, delta prime? Well, perhaps even instead of using a sh shorthand to get a better feeling, let's write this as the derivative of the delta. And what is this? It is the minus f prime of a. If, sorry, if a is zero, of course, that's zero. Derivative, well, it's a, more or less it's obvious in the second. Once uh, you understand the better definition of the delta in the first relationship, second is an integration by parts only, right? First you integrate the by parts, 
and then carry out the original relationship which gives you the, the minus sign is due to the integration by parts and derivative is obvious, right, after that. So that's a beautifully simple looking expression. That's not a, such a beautifully simple looking expression. I'm going to use that formula in here. Well, if you don't feel comfortable, we can split this into two. Notice that it's nicely factored. There is one integration and another integration. Let me write it in that factorized form so that you feel a little comfortable about this. The, that nice complicated factor I leave out. Okay, and also let's take this i h bar out too. That's another important. You are not, you cannot afford to miss factors like h bar, right? It's such a huge difference it creates small in the large or small sense. So we we have taken this out, and let me, as this is the <laughs> gradient with respect to the x prime, let me write the uh, x integral first, which is d cube x e to the i omega over c n dot x. It's there. What else is there? It is this one, which is there, right? So perhaps, let me simplify a little bit. Instead of writing two steps, notice that what, is, what depends on x is this, this function and that function. Let me factor i. The first term is omega over c times n. The second one is minus p over h bar dotted into x. Nice, isn't it? So x thing is a single exponential nicely. And let's look at the uh, what else? Everything else depends on the prime quantity. So this is the first integral nicely factored. And this is the second integral, d cube x prime. What are the things that I have to write? I have this thing e to the minus z r prime over a zero times epsilon dotted into del x prime times del cube x minus x prime. Now you can feel a little more comfortable because notice that these two integrals are nicely factored at this level. This is the one which I have to focus on. It only depends on the x prime, so I can carry out this integration by using this expression. Standard depth and form. This is the one dimensional, that's the three dimensional, that's the only difference involving complicated set of indices involving vectors. So if I carry out this integration, it is this fact, this derivative, epsilon dot del goes here with a minus sign. It moves from here to there, right? It moves from here to there with a minus sign and the derivative. So let me copy it now. F, f of i, the i h bar, that factor, which will turn our attention a little later, and there's also coming from that with a minus sign, although we can afford to carry out such minus sign mistakes as we are going to take the square of the entire thing at the end of the day. But still, let's do it correctly, you know, as a good habit. So d cube x, this is already there. Let me uh, introduce a definition. What is this? Omega over c times n is the wave vector of the photon. p over h bar is the wave vector of the outgoing electron. And let's define this difference as q, the difference, momentum difference or wave vector difference up to factor of h between the incoming photon and outgoing electron. That momentum difference counts. It's an important thing. So I can simplify that notation and write it as e to the i q dot x. How oh, nice. Simplify it tremendously, remembering that q is that omega over c, blah, blah. And there is the diff this uh, derivative gradient is acting on that. Epsilon dotted on del. Now it's, everything is x. x prime is gone. There is single variable x and it's the gradient is over that. So e to the minus z r over a zero 
You see, we have covered a good, good ground. It's already simplified tremendously, but obviously not at the level we desire. And we have to continue a little bit. Let's carry out one more integration by parts. Reason, you'll see the reason. This Q dot epsilon simplifies and becomes constant and moves out. Instead of acting this on that R, which is quite complicated exponential expression. So in another integration by parts. Another minus sign, so that minus sign go, goes away. IH bar, normalization factor one half, d cube x, epsilon dotted into del, this time acting on e to the i q dot x. I put this bracket so that you realize what operator is acting on what block and it doesn't do any harm to the others. So that stays out, minus z r over a zero. So let me work this out. What is this? This brings down iq. So it is i epsilon dot q times e to the i q dot x. How nice. It is simple as such. But then what is epsilon dot q? Epsilon is the polarization vector on the plane front. And Q is the momentum difference. So epsilon dotted into omega over C n minus P over H bar. OK. What is this? Polarization vector is orthogonal to the e propagation direction. So that's 0. So this simply minus 1 over H bar epsilon dot p, which is independent of the integration, I can take it out. How nice. So let me write that. H bars cancel and I have a minus minus i times that normalization factor times epsilon dot p. p is the momentum eigenvalue now. Not of when it, when there are operators, I put the label OP not to get confused, so they are safe. It is epsilon dot p, pf as a matter of fact. Now let's put that f. It is the momentum of the outgoing final electron. Okay. How oh, nice. So what is left over? What is left over is just this integral. It's amazing that we could reduce it so quickly to this form. e to the i q dot x minus z r over a zero. So that is the only integral which is yet to be carried out. All the rest is just the physical parameters involved in the f problem. Okay, so it's the f. Let me write that f. Okay. So let me copy this to here. Yes. yes. Minus i z cube pi a zero cube l cube to the power one half epsilon dot p f times an integral. Let me call this integral as curly i. An integral is this expression. And we are going to carry out this integral now. What is this? Integral is d cube x e to the i q dot x minus the r over a zero.
you see, it's not a, that easy and integral, but we are now uh, in a position that we can carry that out. Let's do that. Here is the <coughs> inner integration space, x1, x2, and x3. And we define this space in such a way that the third axis is parallel to this physical Q, which we have a control on physically. Q is the difference in the wave vectors of the photon minus the electron. Let me remind you again, Q is the wave vector of the photon minus wave vector of the outgoing electron. So it is that quantity. We take that and say, we say that this physical moment, this physical vector should define us the third direction of the internal space. Then we define the spherical polar coordinates in this particular space. Here is the phi and here is the theta. That's x. So what is q dot x in here? q dot x is q r cosine theta, correct? The magnitude of the q vector, magnitude of the x vector, which is r, and the cosine of the angle between these and that. So it is qr cosine theta. And that is already the r. So notice that this integral, the integrand, doesn't depend on the phi, phi angle. So we can already carry out the phi angle. What is the measure? This measure is the d omega, the solid angle that is, dr r squared. And what is the solid angle d phi? Let's write this as, instead of d theta sine theta, let's, let's write this as d cos theta. And cos theta is the new variable because it appears in here explicitly. So that's the measure of the space. Therefore, the integral then is, if I carry out this angle, nothing depends on it. It's, it gives us 2 pi, 2 pi dr r squared e to the minus z r over a zero times d cos theta. Now, if it is the new variable, cos theta is the new variable, and the range is from minus one to plus one, and then e to the i q r cos theta. So everything is quite nice and under control. So the integral furthermore becomes Two pi integral dr r squared d to the z r over a zero. I don't think it is necessary at this level that the, the line r line is half line. It is not minus infinity to plus infinity. It is zero to infinity. That never should be overlooked. Spherical polar coordinates forces on the linear variable forces you on the half line. And what about the other integral? It is one over i q r will call the cos theta a new variable like c and carry out the c integration. So it is 1 over i q r times e to the i q r minus e to the minus i q r. Q is the constant, you take it out, r cancels one of the r's in the measure of the radial part. So it is 2 pi over i q dr r e to the IQR minus CR over A0 minus E to the minus IQR minus CR over A0. So it's simplified, really. And I have to carry out this radial integration now using a parametric integration technique. It's a nice technique. So what is the, let's define a variable. Uh, well, let me first of all rewrite it in the following fashion e to the minus r z over a zero minus i q and this one e to the minus r z over a zero plus i q for obvious reasons and i will define a new parameter now alpha plus minus as z over a zero plus minus i q z over a zero part doesn't change sign, the imaginary part 
oscillates its change sign from plus to minus, but obviously for the integration purposes, it doesn't do any difference. So this curly integral i is related to an ordinary generic integral like dr r e to the minus alpha r. So this is our generic integral. Let's carry out this generic integral and substitute up. I have suppressed the, in the indices of the alpha that because in the upper expression, the actual expression, there are two alphas. One is the alpha plus, the other is the alpha minus. But this generic one is simply that because it's just a constant. How do we carry, out, carry this out rather fast? By noticing that this can be written as minus d by d alpha e to the minus alpha r. And if you take that derivative out for the time being, so of course, we are going to carry this out eventually. It is minus d by d alpha. It doesn't depend on the integral. Therefore, dr e to, e to the minus alpha r integral 0 to infinity. You carry out this integral now. If you carry out this integral, it is minus 1 over alpha e to the minus alpha r determined at infinity minus at 0, right? That's the result of that simple integral. Alpha is, alpha has two parts. One is the real part and the other is the oscillatory part. Whatever that oscillatory part, it is, it is in the form of a product e to the minus a real number times r then e to the i another real number times r. That oscillates. When r is at infinity, it oscillates very fast and even washes out. But the first factor, e to the minus a real number times r, when r goes to infinity, is zero. So the upper limit is very safe in two ways, for the real part and the oscillatory part. Fast oscillation averages out to zero. So it is zero minus one, because lower limit is just one. So it is plus one over i alpha. One over alpha, sorry. This is plus one over alpha. So this integral is minus d by d alpha derivative of 1 over alpha. 1 over alpha gives you the derivative minus 1 over alpha squared. There is another minus sign in the front, so altogether it's plus 1 over alpha squared. Nice. This is the generic integral i. So if I transpose that to the actual integral curly i, let's see what we get. Okay, the integral, curly one, r2 pi over i q. The first integral is 1 over alpha minus squared. The second is 1 over alpha plus squared. You see how nice? You have to just substitute what alpha minus and alpha pluses are. Let's do that. So it is 2 pi over i q. 1 over 0 over a 0 minus i q squared is the first term minus 1 over 0 over a 0 plus i q squared is the second term. Equate the denominators. So you get 2 pi over i q. If you equate the denominators, you have the cross terms surviving, squares cancel because of the relative minus sign between. It is 2iq over z over a is another 2 coming from there because minus and minus is plus. So 4iq, z over a 0 is the one in the numerator divided by z squared, a 0 squared plus q squared squared. How nice, everything is really turning into some nice form. That's the integral. You see IQs are obviously cancelling that and that. So it is 8 pi z over a0 from one factor from here times 1 over z squared over a0 squared q 
2 squared squared is the integral. So I can now go back to this relationship and determine the amplitude because it is the curly I is determined. So let's do that. It's F now. F of I is minus I Z cube over Oh, by the way, let's write it as z cube over a0 cube. Well, for obvious reason, let me do that. You'll see that z over a0 is a new form which is coming out altogether. So there's a minus i pi to the minus a half. And z over a0, 3 halves. Times l to the minus 3 halves. So I'm writing it in this fashion on purpose. Epsilon dot PF there. And this F integral, sorry, there. The curly integral is here. 8 pi z over a0, 1 over z squared over a0 squared plus q squared squared is my matrix element. Okay, so what we do now is substitute it in the into one of the intermediate expressions to get the cross section. Okay, so. Let me do that. What was the differential cross section? Saatim is nasıl? Benim saat yavaş gidiyor. Birimiz var. Tamam. Okay, we can write that now. D sigma, D omega. Okay. Alpha over two pi. Okay, şu aradaki intermediate ifadeyi bir versene bana yine. D sigma over D omega'yı. Bunu notlardan farklı yapıyorum. Tamam. This was the intermediate expression that we have. Now we are finished with the f because this was already previously computed. What I have to do is now take the square and sub substitute in here. So let's do that. 2 pi alpha l cube divided by 2 pi h squared. h bar kf divided by m omega times pi to the minus 1 z over a0 to the 3 third power, another z over a0 squared in here, fifth power, l to the minus 3, epsilon dot pf squared, and there is 8 pi squared, perhaps I have to put it all the way here, 8 pi squared, divided by z squared, a0 squared, q squared to the fourth power. The first thing that we have to observe and then we can give a short break is that these mathematical scale we have put in at the beginning to define the normalization and the, to count the number of states, they cancel nicely. They disappear. It's very gratifying. And all the rest we have to uh, discuss physically after the break and uh, discuss, finish the subject, but we'll do that after the break, okay?